October hosts one of the most iconic holidays of the year. Of course, I'm talking about Nevada Day. What did you think I was going to say? You see, on October 31st, 1864, Nevada was admitted to the Union as the 36th state. But I guess that's the same day as Halloween, so sure, we can talk about that one. I've decided to play through Pokemon Ultra Moon for the first time using Hardcore Nuzlocke rules and only Ghost-type Pokemon. Let's see how it goes. After the initial cutscene of this girl in white running away from other people in white and getting stopped by even more people in white and blue, my journey begins as all heroes must. Being awoken by a cat. Why am I wearing shoes in bed, by the way? That's so unsanitary. And instead of, you know, changing the dirty clothes I was literally just sleeping in, I simply put on a hat and backpack and now I'm ready to go face the great beyond? That's gross. On Route 1, I am attacked by this critter with big, pointy teeth, as three Pokemon come to my rescue and scare the thing off. Turns out, these Pokemon belong to the Professor, who, after some nonsense babbling, lets me keep one of them for myself. I choose Rowlet for obvious reasons. Since I've never played a Gen 7 game before, I allow myself a few liberties, and this is the first one. Even though Bruce Willis doesn't know he's a ghost yet, I will allow myself to use him or else this run would be impossible. I do the same thing with Cubone a bit later on as well. Further down the road, I run into my rival, Hal, who is almost always inexplicably happy. He decides to give Bruce Willis a break and chooses the water seal instead of the fire kitten. As you might imagine, this means our first fight is simple. The seal hits a pound, but falls to two leaf ages. Easy peasy. I'm sure he'll never give me any trouble. I then run into the same girl in white we saw at the beginning, Lily, who just stands idly by watching her poor little Pokemon get picked on by some Spiro? I decide to help and am not only pecked by those Spiro, but also blown up and almost fall into the river far below. Man, being a good guy really doesn't pay off. After getting saved by a Dragon Ball Z-like character and meeting more weirdos from the beginning cutscene, I have another rival fight. Didn't we just do this? But this time he has a Pichu, which turns the entire tide of battle. Just kidding, he does lower my attack with charm though. Bruce Willis is still strong enough to overcome that and leads us to victory. I'm gonna skip the rival fights from now on unless something noteworthy or interesting happens. At the Prof's lab, I get a Rotom Pokedex that talks to me and thinks he's funny. Just what I've always wanted. Jumping ahead to the trainer school, I have to beat up four kids before I can progress and that is easy enough. What isn't easy, however, is the fight against the teacher. You see, she has the starter that Dopey Howe was supposed to take. So, with no other Pokemon, I know it's a lost cause going into the fight. But I try it anyway, and maybe I get super lucky? Spoiler alert, I don't. Bruce does manage to hit three pecks thanks to an Orenberry, and if two of those three were crit, I could have won. That's not too much to ask for now, is it? Anyway, he dies, for real this time, and my journey has to start over. As a side note, these games make you jump through so many hoops to delete your save file. It's like cheat code inputs back in the day. I am, again, rudely woken up by a cat and then fairly quickly get right back to the trainer school. To beat her, I could do one of two things. Either blow past the totem level cap, which might make my Pokemon strong enough to beat her, or get a second encounter a little bit early. So I decide to perform a seance and get Litwick because he can be caught via island scan in the cemetery. Ghost Rider just so happens to have flash fire, so this Lil Litten can't do anything to him. After some embers and fire spin damage, I have avenged my death and get great balls in return. Another side note, maybe it's just me, but I feel like in this game, everybody is always handing me stuff. Like I beat them in a fight, they give me great balls or PP max or whatever it may be. I play a mini game of Pokemon Snap and have my first encounter with Team Skull, whose eyes get ridiculously wide every time they lose. Elima then tests me to see if I'm ready for his trial, which seems a bit redundant because I thought the trial was supposed to be the test. So is this a pre-trial trial or something? I leave with Bruce against his Yungus. After getting him down to the red, I decide to swap to Ghost Rider, who he can't hit, and takes him out with a combo of Fire Spin and Ember. Last is Smeargle, who not only can't hurt me, he even gives my fire moves a little boost. Thanks, man. Anyway, 
I destroy his normal team, and he deems me worthy to begin the real trial. But first, I need to get past a Tauros, and my only options are to boop it on its nose, try to trip it, or straight up grab its horns like a maniac. None of these seem like good options, if I'm being honest. But now you know, the next time you're trying to face down a bull, which I'm sure is an everyday occurrence, you apparently just grab its horns. I'm sure nothing bad will happen. After narrowly avoiding becoming a ghost myself, both my Pokemon end up at level 13, which is already higher than the imposed totem level cap. And I haven't even gotten to the trial yet. So from now on, the totem levels will be more guidelines than actual rules. I won't purposely level up past them, but I also won't avoid using Pokemon if the forced battles put my guys above their level. I snag some ground berries that are most certainly rotten because fruit decomposes when left on the ground, and finally get to the first trial. Not to be confused with the pre-trial trial which I already passed. The first totem Pokemon is a big, fat Raticate, who gets a defense boost. Ghost Rider would be more than useless in this fight, so it's all up to Bruce Willis. Brucey takes a bite and does a decent chunk with Razor Leaf before Raticate calls for help and a little Rattata comes along. I avoid a tackle, that was lucky, and almost kill the little rat in one hit. He does fall next turn as I heal with a berry and get my defense lowered. Raticate's bite now does a good amount of damage, but one last razor leaf and the bigger rat also falls. I know it looked easy, but a crit or two here and I would have been toast. For completing the trial, I get the Normalium Z and learn its associated dance move. By the way, I will allow myself to use Z moves in this run which is a good thing because it's a hard enough run without making it worse. But to keep things interesting, I'll limit myself to one Z move a battle, say. I run into my rival Howe again, and this time he has a Noibat, which still gets trounced by an Omni Bruce, who then evolves as a result. Nice. But that also means I'm past the Grand Kahuna level cap. So at this point, I turn off the experience share, which hopefully stops my guys from overleveling too much, though it's hard to control with only two Pokemon it's time for the first Grand Kahuna fight. I start with Ghost Rider to deal some damage to Machop, but he immediately swaps to Crab Brawler, which really sucks because this guy has Pursuit, which would totally kill me if I try to run away because it does double damage. My only option here is to try to burn him with a Will-O-Wisp and it works, thank goodness. On the next turn, I swap to Bruce as he heals his burn. The Crab does a bit of damage to me, but falls in two packs. Out comes the Makuhita, but I swap to Ghost Rider on a fake out and start to deal some chip damage with Ember and Burn. Makuhita can't hurt me at all, so I'm safe, but he also has thick fat, so he's pretty safe too, to be honest. Eventually, after missing him 500 million times, give or take 499 million, I get tired and swap to an expert belted Bruce, who gets sand thrown in his face immediately and proceeds to miss the next three pecs. All the while, this Makuhita is hitting me with five times arm thrusts, twice in a row. What the heck is going on here? Finally, on the fourth peck, Bruce can see clearly now and takes out the sumo. Last, we have Machop, so I give Ghost Rider one last chance to increase his body count. He burns the Machop and slowly but surely takes him out with embers. It helps that Machop also can't hit me, though he does heal at one point, so it takes a little while. Still, the first grand trial is done. Look at us go. And now, I can ride on that bull that almost killed me earlier. Time to show him who's boss. Before leaving this island forever and never coming back, I investigate some weird occurrences at the school, one of which ends up being a Drifloom called Peeves. He's quite a nuisance at centers of education. Oh, I also become emo and wear all black. That makes sense for a ghost trainer, right? Embodying the spirit of a not yet dead Tony Hawk, unless something really unfortunate happens before this video comes out, in which case this is a messed up joke, I travel to the next island by surfing on a manatee, with literally zero practice. I thought surfing was way harder than that, but apparently not. Guess where I'm going on my next vacation? Nowhere, I don't have money for that. After defeating Hal, yet again, without too much trouble, I save an awesome looking ice Vulpix. If only he was a ghost, I could use him. Oh well. On the ranch, one of the Tauros is acting up, so the farmers to put it bluntly, pimp out their mill tank to try and calm him down. That was a bit weird to watch, if I'm being honest. It's at this point I have my first encounter with Team Skull's Gladia, and this guy is going to be a huge pain in the butt the entire run. 
I mean, his aura isn't too bad, and the Zubat dies in one Z move, but his type Null, what kind of a name is that by the way, has Pursuit. Bruce takes him down pretty low, so I swap into Peeves for free, because of Tackle, who barely survives two Pursuits and eventually kills the guy with Gust. You'll see during this run that basically everybody has dark moves for some reason. Bite, Pursuit, and Crunch, to a lesser degree, are super popular in Alola. Then, it's on to the next totem Pokemon, Araquanid, who is misnamed by the way because he only has six legs. Arachnids have eight. So, against this fake spider, an expert belted Peeves takes a ton from Bubble and doesn't do all that much with Gust. But hopefully, it's enough. When the Masquerain comes out, I swap to Bruce Willis to avoid Sunspore, that was nice, and tank a Bubble. After getting hit by a weak Bug Bite and a really strong Aurora Beam, one supersonic strike should now be enough to kill the water insect. And it is. Nice. I pivot to Ghost Rider because everyone else got a chance in this fight, and after getting paralyzed and bug bit a few times, my little candle wins with three flame bursts. And then hogs all the glory for winning. But he's cute, so it's okay. We finished the first two trials, but don't worry, things will be much more difficult soon enough. Lana shows me how to water bend, and then brags about catching a red Gyarados that one time. Please. I've caught dozens of those things. And this is the point in the video where I'm obligated to ask you to like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. But as an added incentive, if you do share this video, you can then request a specific Nuzlocke in the comments, and I'm going to pick one of you wonderful people and attempt that Nuzlocke. So share this video, tell me you shared it, and request a Nuzlocke. I didn't quite follow the explanation for the Battle Royale, and so I was stuck with Ghost Rider as my fighter, who probably gets picked on and dies horribly. That was fun, but I'm not counting that as a real death. Then a store employee gives me a 50% off everything coupon just for walking into the store, which doesn't seem like a sustainable business model to me, but that's okay, it's his loss. With my half off Great Balls, I find and catch a Cubone by this volcano. Again, I will use Corpse Bride even though she's not a ghost yet. Before attempting the totem, I realize I skipped an encounter. So, I backtrack to find a Carbink, who I threaten mercilessly until he calls for help. And by that, I obviously mean I hit him with a super weak false swipe, but it worked, and a Sableye appears. I put this poor Carbink out of his misery, he suffered enough, and name this new member KQY. Can you figure out what it means? Well, I can't, so I find the name raider and change it to Kayako which is what it was supposed to be in the first place, I just hit the wrong buttons. This trial consists of watching some Marowaks dance, so it's super difficult. Before the actual totem Pokemon, I take out a smaller Marowak with Peeves' ominous wind. Actually, that wasn't Peeves, that was just the chair. Then, Corpus Bride comes in to take out the Magmar with a single Bone Meringue, after taking a bit of damage. Now it's on to the real trial, the Marowak with a speed boost. Anticipating a detect, I use Rain Dance to decrease his fire damage, and then he calls a Salamander. With the Rain up, Peep survives the next two hits and does some damage with Ominous Wind, though an Omni Boost would have been nice here. I take a risk by staying in and pop a Wiki Berry next turn to heal before getting off another Ominous Wind. Because I just used a Berry and I have Unburden, I should now be faster than Marowak, so I considered staying in, but I don't want to lose Peeps. Instead, I pivot to Kayako, who gets poisoned and takes a chunk of damage, but manages to use a rain-powered Hydro Vortex, knocking out the Charmander knockoff. You may be wondering why I didn't hit the Marowak. Well, I was pretty sure he was going to use Detect, which he didn't, but that's okay. I'm still confident a Priority Shadow Sneak can kill him now. Or not. Are you kidding me? There's barely any red there. That's like one HP. And of course, this causes Kayako to die, because why not? I bring out Corpus Bride to protect Stall with leftovers and just hope that I don't miss or get a crit, which thankfully I don't. Well, I barely had a chance to use her, but Kayako did a good job and I couldn't have won the trial without her. This gives me access to the Charizard fly ability, which is actually pretty awesome. I use it to fly to a Poké Center to put Kayako into the dead again box. It sucks that I lost my counter to dark moves already. In the grass trial, I apparently picked the wrong berry, resulting in an epic battle of wheels, where this grass mantis is completely obliterated by my new fire crystal. The totem Pokemon, however, requires a bit more finesse, but 
literally only a tiny bit. I start with a regular flame burst to deal some damage as she calls a Kecreon. Then, after getting hit and screeched, I finish off the stronger Mantis with another Z move. Hitting a weaker move first and then this stronger one ensure that it would die without using synthesis to prolong the fight, because a single Z move wasn't going to kill him. Against the Kecreon, I swap to Corpse Bride on a sunny day and hit with Brick Break, which does way less than I had hoped. Bruce Willis comes out, misses out on the kill with a peck, but a second one finishes the job. We're halfway done with the trials and things are going pretty well, actually. I then head to a laboratory and hear all about these ultra wormholes, which is apparently a very rare phenomenon that I see literally five seconds later as soon as I exit the building. What a coincidence. I get through Diglett Tunnel, that's a bit more confusing than its Cantonian counterpart, and decide I want to change my hair. So I pay $2,000 to not actually change my hair. And she doesn't give me my money back even though she did literally nothing. What a waste. I use some more money to buy Aerial Ace to teach to my flying guys. But apparently, the only Pokemon who can learn it is the Ground Rodent. In the cemetery, I find Ghastly, who I name Bloody Mary. And I'm surprised I could actually call her that. Around this time, both Bloody Mary and Corpse Bride evolve, and I begin the Plumeria fight. But it's not really much of a fight, because Corpse Bride just dominates everybody. With her out of the way, we're on to the second Grand Kahuna fight against Olivia after performing another seance, that is, to get a Hone Edge. I could have gotten a Hone Edge using Island Scan, but I was lazy. I also keep meaning to name her, but never actually get around to doing it. So yeah, procrastination is not your friend. Unfortunately, this Hone Edge doesn't have a single steel attacking move, because that would make this fight super easy. Instead, I'm forced to use Iron Defense and Automize. I'm not really a big fan of setup moves generally in Nuzlocke's, but I'll have to use them quite a bit in this run because it's a rough run. After I'm done setting up, I start using Brick Break. After two hits, Anorath heals and then dies in three more hits. The Lycan Rock comes out and can barely do anything to me even with a Z move. He also dies in three hits. Last is the Leaf, whose brine does more damage than both of the previous Pokemon combined, but with Leftovers healing and protect, I manage to stay healthy enough to take it out. Jumping ahead a bit, I catch myself Zero, the Sandy Guest. I've never used one before, so I'm excited to see if I like this Pokemon. I meet up with a creepy guy who immediately convinces me to travel with him to a secluded island paradise. He doesn't even offer me candy. I'm not eager to go. How and I get to this futuristic island that is so perfect looking, I'm sure nothing sketch would ever happen here. I'm doubly sure that the president, Lusamina, doesn't have any secret plot or agenda. Some more plot stuff happens with my second extremely rare wormhole, and I have another fight with Hal that I will actually show this time, which probably means that something is going to go down. He starts with his starter, and I start with mine. That's why they're called starters. Since I can't kill him in one hit, I go for Ominous Wind to deal a bit of damage, and I get a lucky Omni Boost. Now, I can take her out with a Bloom Doom. This baits Flareon, so I pivot to Corpse Bride, who tanks and disables a Fire Fang. Nice. Now he can't actually hit me. So I anticipate a swap and he brings out Tauros on a flame charge. He immediately swaps back to Flareon as I swapped to Hone Edge, who again, I never end up naming. Well, that was interesting. We repeat the same story where I bring out Corpse Bride on a Fire Fang, but this time he doesn't run away, allowing me to hit with a Bone Meringue that almost kills him, but not quite. He flinches me with a Fire Fang and once I'm down to 7 HP, I finally kill him with a Rock Tomb. Against the Noibat, I pivot to Bruce on a Bite, and then bring out Hone Edge on a Wing Attack. I alternate between Iron Defense and Protect for a little while to get some healing, and then start using Brick Break, while still using Protect too. Shadow Claw would do more damage, but I want to bide my time and heal as much as possible with Leftovers. Which I know isn't the best idea, because a crit could ruin all of it, but I don't have many other options. Eventually, the bat goes down, and I'm almost fully healed. Against Tauros, I obviously start with Protect, and then break some bricks, while taking almost nothing from Pursuit. You may be thinking this fight doesn't look so bad right now, so what am I concerned about? But then, his Raichu comes out. His Psychic takes me down pretty low, as my Shadow Ball doesn't kill him. Peeves should be able to tank a few hits, 
So I bring him out and is immediately crit. Well, that's fantastic. So now I need to make a sacrifice to ensure that I actually win this fight. It's time to say goodbye to the sandcastle that I've had for all of 10 minutes. I hardly knew ye. But his sacrifice lets Bloody Mary come out and kill with a priority sucker punch. That Raichu was way tougher than it had any right to be. I won, but at what cost? I take a break from my journey to read some library books, like a nerd, and make my way to the next trial. After using an ability capsule on Corpse Bride to give him Lightning Rod, that is. For this trial, I have to mess around with some bugs, but it's really not that complicated. And I do have a few simple fights before the totem, but again, not complicated. At one point, we give this machine too much power, causing it to do a perfect 180, almost blasting the electric bugs, until Toja Tomorrow, and then a much bigger Toja Tomorrow, come to save the day. And the big guy wants to fight. To begin with, I anticipate a spiky shield, so I use Rock Tomb because it doesn't make contact. He then calls his buddy Skarmory, who I decide to attack with a flame charge as I get tormented. Anticipating another spiky shield, I again use Rock Tomb, and yep, I probably should have attacked the Skarmory instead, but that's okay. After taking a bit of damage, Skarmory gets another flame charge to the face, and then I protect at the same time he uses Spiky Shield to get some healing. I hit the totem with a Bone Meringue, that doesn't do as much as I had hoped to be honest, but at this point the Tailwind peters out, so I outspeed and finish off the Skarmory. Now it's just you and me, Pikachu wannabe. I hit another Bone Meringue and tank an Iron Head as he calls out another fake Pikachu. How many of these things are there? We both take a turn to protect, and then the fat guy falls to one last Bone Meringue as I get charmed. Since I'm still tormented here, even though that felt like forever ago, I can't use Bone Meringue, so I hit with a Rock Tomb instead as I get charmed again. Against this guy, I basically can't lose, though it does take a while. I swap to Bruce Willis and then pivot back to Corpse Bride and slowly but surely take out the rat. After being charmed like a million times, that is. That wasn't all that hard to be honest, but it was certainly drawn out. Unfortunately, at this point in the recordings, there are several corrupted video files that I just can't seem to recover. So, we miss a couple of things, including the first Guzma fight, even though the strat for the second fight is very similar. We also miss that I catch a snow runt and a frillish. At least the Mimikyu totem fight still does work. This guy gets an Omni boost and Corpse Bride survives a hit, but it did a lot of damage. He responds with a Rock Tomb to slow the Mimikyu down and break the disguise. Now I need a sacrifice. I was going to sacrifice Shuppet, but I can't get one yet, apparently, so instead I send out Snow Run. Sorry friend, no Frost Last for you. Her sacrifice lets me bring out a Choice Specs Bloody Mary, who now outspeeds and one-shots the Mimikyu with a Shadow Ball. Or maybe not even close. Huh. And obviously Bloody Mary dies. But at least Shadow Claw gets disabled, so that's something. It's at this point that I realize these major battles seem to have EV training, so that's fun. I decide to bring out Duo Blade to tank a play rough and a Screech before killing Mimikyu with a Shadow Claw. Even with that defense drop, I should be able to survive, and I win the battle with one last Shadow Claw. Well, I completed the trial, but lost two Pokemon, and Gengar is probably my favorite ghost, so it sucks that he didn't really ever get to do anything. Bloody Mary, I'm sorry. After some more story stuffs, I break into Team Skull's secret town hideout that is absolutely wrecked and covered in graffiti. These guys need to take better care of their things. Even the inside of the house is messed up. I have another Guzma fight, and this one I can actually show you. It's basically the same strat as the first time that got corrupted, but it actually is a little bit worse. So he starts with Golisopod, who has Sucker Punch. So I make him waste PP by using Stockpile. After a few turns of that, I start using Acrobatics and tank a few Razor Shells. In a few hits, this guy gets scared and runs to his mommy and is replaced with a Pincer. He hits me with a Throat Chop that totally would have killed me if it crit, but it didn't. And after healing with a Berry, I outspeed and take him out with a now two times powered Acrobatics. The Masquerade intimidates me and slows me down before dying to two more acrobatics. That was kind of close though. His first and last Pokemon comes back out to die in one more hit. 
That wasn't a great fight, to be honest. I thought acrobatics would do more than it did, but I guess I'm just lucky that Peeves didn't die. This guy then has a complete meltdown after losing. I leave this crappy place after stealing his treasure, that is. At this point, I do something I've been debating for a while and finally just decide to go for it. And that is to catch a Caterpie, of course. Didn't see that coming now, did you? After becoming a Butterfree with compound eyes, we head back to the volcano to use Thief on some Cubones. Now you probably do see where I'm going with this. In case you didn't know, compound eyes boost the chance of a wild Cubone having the item that I'm looking for, from 5% to 20%. So it's pretty nice. In what feels like no time at all, I am the proud new owner of a thick club that just so happens to double Marowak's attack stat, which will be immediately useful in the fight against Gladion. The Golbat hits me with acrobatics, while Corpus Bride takes it out in two flame charges. He then sends out Type Null, who is actually not Type Null, but is outsped and dies to a Brick Break anyway. Then the real Type Null survives a hit and does miss out on the kill with Pursuit before dying. That was another really close fight. I did tell you there were a lot of these plays that weren't particularly well done on my part. For example, a simple crit there could have killed me, but I am doing the best I can here. From now on though, let's assume that unless I say otherwise, Corpse Ride will have a thick club, because why in the world would I take it off? Jumping ahead, I find out that this chill cop is the Grand Kahuna here, because of course he is. He taunts me with his living Sableye, who I take out in two flame charges. After, again, taking more damage from a Shadow Ball than I thought I would. This brings out Crocorock, but even with the Intimidate, I take him out with a single broken brick. Next comes the Persian, who will 100% outspeed and kill me. So, I swap into a healthy Mary, not to be confused with the dead Bloody Mary, as a sacrifice, and Persian wastes her Z move. That was perfect. Sorry, no longer Healthy Mary, you're dead. This lets me bring in Bruce Willis, who has U-Turn and the Bugnium Z that I stole from Guzma. But because I still don't know all that much about this game, I kind of thought that the Z move U-Turn would still let me swap Pokemon after it hit, which it 100% does not. So I'm an idiot, and now it looks like I'm gonna have to sacrifice another Pokemon. This is just taking a turn for the worst. I eventually decide on Samra Morgan as a sacrifice, who can survive one Dark Pulse and then disables it like a beast. That was perfect timing. After surviving a Power Gem, she takes out the Persian with a Brine. After I win, the Kahuna tries to scare me by making himself appear larger than he actually is. But I'm no bear, I don't fall for that nonsense. Before heading back to the so-called Paradise that seems to have some issues, I buy a Dusk Stone from this kid and haven't yet decided who I'm going to evolve with it. I, once again, take a stranger's boat to Aether Paradise, but this one is pure black, so it's even more sketch than the previous one. And then I battle my way through this front of evil doers. Before I can face off against the Prez, it's time for yet another Guzma fight. But this time, I start with Samra Morgan and stall sucker punches yet again. I just keep using Recover. After hitting him with two Shadow Balls, he runs away again, baiting out Vicavolt. But obviously, I pivot to Corpse Bride on a Thunderbolt and kill the Electric Bug with two Flame Charges, after tanking a Flash Cannon. Out comes Pinsir, who I now outspeed and kill with a single Fire Punch. His Golosopod comes back out and dies to a Thunder Punch. Last is Masquerade, who intimidates me, but still dies in a single punch. That was way smoother than last time. After another, uh, mini meltdown, I use my Dusk Stone to evolve Ghost Rider to his final form. And I get involved in some family drama. Don't you just hate it when you're hanging out at your friend's house trying to just have a relaxing evening and they start arguing with their parents and you're sitting there pretending you don't hear but it's super awkward and then their mom tries to beat you up? Oh, I guess that only happens in Pokemon. That's pretty messed up. She starts off with Clefable, who Corpse Bride can take out in two hits unless he gets charmed, and she swaps to Melotic instead. That's lame. So, I swap to Samra Morgan, who disables the Dragon Pulse. Awesome. And what follows is a bit of a long fight, where I use Sludge Wave to poison the Melotic, and then I use Hydro Pump. After a while, 
with poison damage, I come out the victor. This baits out the Lilligant, so I just pivot to Ghost Rider on a Teeter Dance, which is unfortunate. I decide to swap to Bruce Willis on the Pedal Dance, and use U-Turn to bring Ghost Rider back out, who kills with a Flame Burst. Clefable reappears, but at this HP, a Choice Bex Flame Burst kills the Moon Fairy. Beware comes out and dies in a single hit. The Low Bunny's Thunder Punch did a ton, so naturally, I swap to Corpse Bride, who takes an Ice Punch, then we exchange Fire Punches, but mine is stronger, winning me the battle. I hope my friends still like me after I beat up their mom. In spite of my clear victory, she does whatever the heck she wants by opening up a wormhole and getting herself sucked in, never to be seen from or heard again. Oh, and Guzma just straight up books it to jump inside. While I was recovering from that traumatic experience, Lily went out and got herself a makeover. Super important stuff here. I befriend a Machamp who just carries me like a little baby. Look at that guy go. In Executor Island, I steal an ancient flute that probably has million year old cooties on it or something, and I am almost ready for the next trial. But first, I need to do some serious sticker collecting. If I had paid attention at the start, I would probably have more than just 15 stickers at this point. Oh well. After getting a ton of stickers, I talk to Professor Oak's brother, Regular Oak, who gives me a Mimikyu, just in time for the Dragon Totem. Before that though, I evolve Dewblade using another Duskstone, but he does not learn King Shield. I thought he got it upon evolving, but nope. Which means that his uses are very limited right now, but we'll see how it goes. I return to the Haunted Megamart and pretend that Mimikyu is better than Pikachu, so I get Mimikyu Z, which I'll use a ton for the rest of the run. And now it's time for the Totem, who falls from the sky and makes a sound at me, or something. He gets an Omni Boost, because of course he does, but that's okay. It's part of the plan. Slimer the Mimikyu, tanks the Poison Jab, thanks to Disguise, and then I copy Sound's Omni Boost, because why the heck not? With all of those boosts, Slimer not only outspeeds the Dragon, but hits him with a super effective Let's Snuggle Forever which is pretty creepy. Now he does have a Rosalie Berry to decrease fairy damage, but with the Omni Boost that Slimer copied, it does more than enough to knock him out in a single hit. Slimer gets screeched by the Norvern, but I don't care. One hit knocks him out too. And that was one of the easiest totem battles I've had this entire run. Lily and I then become master flautists. Either that or we're so bad that Necrozma just comes to beat us up. You be the judge. Either way, Ghost Rider is faster and takes it out with a single Z-move. That wasn't so bad now, was it? But here, I run into a bit of an issue. It has nothing to do with Pokemon per se, it's more the lack of capabilities in my very legitimate 3DS. You see, you're supposed to use motion controls to jump through these wormholes, but I simply can't. Thankfully, however, the internet came to my rescue because you can change the controls to a circle pad by talking to this random guy right here. Being able to move never felt so good. Now that I can actually do what I'm supposed to do here, I quickly find the wormhole with Ultra Necrozma, who is not only 10 levels higher than before, but he gets a freaking Omni Boost. This is going to be a pain. I leave with Slimer and just hope that he goes for the super effective Smart Strike instead of Photon Geyser because Photon Geyser would bypass my disguise. He obliges me, thankfully, and takes a decent chunk of damage, but still survives. And now, I need to make a sacrifice. I caught fodder in secret, because I was going to sacrifice him right now. This creepy anchor is weird. But since I've actually never used one, I have a change of heart at the very last second, and bring out Peeves instead. I'm sorry friend, this was an ending you didn't deserve, but someone has to die. The worst part is, I never actually end up using fodder anyway, so I just killed Peeves for nothing. Peeves' sacrifice lets me bring in Ghost Rider for free, who hangs on with a Focus Sash, and almost kills with a Shadow Ball. I thought he was supposed to die. So, I hard switch to Aegislash on another Power Gem, Protect to get some leftovers healing, survive a Photon Geyser, and kill with a Shadow Claw. There was probably an easier way to kill this guy, I just couldn't come up with anything better. And at this point, I was sure they were going to let me catch that Moon Pokemon, but apparently not. That's lame. 
So let's just get started with the last trial, which begins with a fight against a starving artist, Mina. But Ghost Rider is going to single flamedly take out her whole team. The only concern is Mawal's Sucker Punch, so I just PP stall with Calm Mind for a few turns and then take out all of her Pokemon with flamethrowers. The Rimbombi does outspeed with a pathetic little Psychic, but I could have tanked that even without a million Calm Minds. Her stupid trial doesn't end there though. It's just the beginning. And now I have to go back to the other islands and fight their captains. Much like the pre-trial trial, this is the pre-Elite 4 Elite 4 that I don't much like. We go to fight Alima and his normal Pokemon. His Gumchoose survives Flamethrower and responds with a crunch that I tank thanks to a Culverberry that cuts super effective dark damage in half. The Trump Wannabe falls in one more hit. Out comes Smeargle, who doesn't scare me at all, and falls to a single hit. Last is his Komala, that I'm just now realizing is Koala with the W upside down. Huh. I swap to Corpse Bride on a Sucker Punch, and then PP stall with Protect, because of course I do. Not a super exciting strat, I know. But once it's safe, Koala goes down in a Brick Break. Almost immediately, I go to face Lana and her water Pokemon. Bruce Willis makes a comeback to tank a Hydro Pump and kill with two Leaf Blades. This brings out Cloyster, who sets up spikes and falls to a Grass Knot. The Water Spider actually outspeeds me, which I didn't see coming, and almost kills me with a Crunch. Had I known he would be so fast, I would have gotten another Culver Berry. Still, Brucey survives and kills with itemless boosted acrobatics. Next, it's onto a volcano to burn in battle against Fire Guy, who leads with Arcanine against Slimer. The Intimidate kinda sucks, but I still do a decent chunk of damage with Never Ending Nightmare as he breaks my disguise. I get a free switch into Ghost Rider on a Flare Blitz, and then outspeed to kill with a Choice Specs Shadow Ball. The Corpse Groom threatens with a Shadow Bone, but never gets to use it. Too bad. The Talonflame comes out, and I swap to Aegislash to tank a Brave Bird and bait a Flame Charge, allowing me to pivot to Corpse Bride. His next Brave Bird still does more than I thought, that is becoming a trend at this point, but one Rock Tomb knocks the bird out. But this portion of the trial is still not over. I have to face the tremendously tough hiker and his single Magmar, whose Slimer Z moves into oblivion. I prepare myself to fight Sophocles next, but he just gives me a pedal, no fisticuffs involved. Apparently you only fight him in Ultra Sun? I'm not sure why. On my way to the pig, I find Guzma, who is in a much better mental state now. He clearly got the help he needed, so good for him. I begin the fight against Nanu, who leads with Sableye against Slimer, but a simple play rough is more than enough to knock out the Dark Ghost. This brings out Persian, who obviously outspeeds me, and chooses to use his Z-move, which is wasted because of my disguise. My Z-move, on the other hand, takes him right out. Last is Absol, who does hit a Sucker Punch, that doesn't do too much, and then dies to a play rough. With that, I head back to Nina's place where she makes a rainbow flower, attracting the totem Pokemon who somehow opens the door. That's kind of terrifying. Okay, this butterfly gets a super Omni Boost, and as if that weren't enough, proceeds to use Quiver Dance. That's fine though, because I copy all of those stats with a Psycho. She calls for Pelipper as her ally, which is unfortunate because that sets up the rain. Still, one Shockwave knocks it out after another Quiver Dance. I hit with Flamethrower to waste her berry, and then copy her stats again after a fourth Quiver Dance. Her Dazzling Gleam does very little to me, and a Flamethrower almost kills her as she calls for help yet again. That's fine, because this Butterfree thing dies in one more Flamethrower. Blissey sets up a Light Screen because there's nothing else she can do, and this may be overkill, but I Inferno Overdrive this Blissey into Smithereens. And just like that, we have officially beaten the last trial. And on we go to the last kahuna, Hapu. She starts with Golork, who Bruce takes out in a single Grass Knot. The same thing happens to Mudsdale too. There isn't much the Flygon can do to me here unless I get paralyzed. So I tank a hit, get a crit leaf blade in return, and then get paralyzed because obviously. I needed an expert belt here, so I couldn't have used a cherry berry. Oh well. I decide to swap into Slimer, who avoids the Dragon Breath and kills Flygon with a Play Rough. Against the Gastrodon, my Z-move barely misses out on the kill, and I avoid a Muddy Water. 
I hit with a feint attack, for some reason, and then knock him out with two Shadow Claws. With the last Grand Trial out of the way, there's nothing stopping us from wrecking the Elite Four. Except for a few Slowpokes, that is. I have a bit of a silly strategy for the last Gladian fight that requires a lagging tail, so I spend a while slowpoke hunting. I eventually get it, and it's time to put this strat to the test. I leave with Slimer, who has the lagging tail, that, out of the goodness of my heart, I give to the Crobat voluntarily. Not only will this slow him down, but now Acrobatics only has 55 base power. So, I swap to Corpse Bride on a very weak Cross Poison, and set up with two flame charges to knock the bat out. The fake Lucario falls in a single brick break, and against the Silvali, I'm basically just hoping that Bone Meringue hits. Which it does, thank goodness. The real Lucario also dies in one brick, as I beat Gladion one last time. I get through the victory road like place and make it to the Pokemon League. I can finally get to the move tutor and teach Aegislash King Shield, meaning he will now be pretty useful. It sucks how light in the game this old lady is. After a few last minute preparations, I head to the Elite Four. But first, Bruce Willis and I have one last moment to bond, in case he doesn't make it out alive. Okay, let's do this. I start with Mulane, the Steel Guy, who I think is going to be the easiest. Ghost Rider should outspeed and kill basically everybody, except for the Klefki, apparently. Thankfully, he does miss his Thunder Wave, but because I had so many speed EVs, I didn't think that was supposed to happen. At least I do kill him in one hit. Dugtrio comes out and can't use Earthquake thanks to my balloon, but a Sucker Punch still does a lot. I don't know why I didn't stall him out like I normally do. That was stupid. I thought I could tank it, I suppose. Either way, he falls to a Flamethrower, as does the Bisharp, who comes out next. The Magnezone, though, does have Sturdy, so I bring out Corpse Bride on a Thunderbolt and kill with two flame charges after getting screeched. Last is Metagross, but I outspeed and use Shadow Bone for the very first time in the game. There were a few hiccups there, but overall, nothing too bad. We're just going clockwise here, so next we go to Olivia. Aegislash leads the charge, and after getting tickled by an X Scissor, kills with an Iron Head. This brings out Probopass, which I was hoping I had a bit more time, but I pivot to Bruce Willis on a Thunder Wave. I came prepared with a berry, so we're all good. On the next turn, I get paralyzed again, and then can't attack for two whole turns. This is just going great. I could have done a Swords Dance setup with Aegislash, but those are so lame, I wanted something else. It's not going super well though. I swap to Samurai Morgan, who tanks a Power Gem, and Scald would kill him if it weren't for the Sandstorm Special Defense Boost. After she gets paralyzed too, the Big Nose heals, and then is immediately burned. Nice. This part of the match takes a while. I get him down to the red, only for him to heal yet again and get burned again. I'm having deja vu here. He sets up another sandstorm. I survive a crit and finally take him out with one last Sculpt. Against Cradley, I immediately bring out Aegislash again to tank an energy ball and decide to just set up sword stands anyway. Next turn, this fossil once again becomes extinct. Her Lycan Rock is still a bit scary and after lowering his attack with King Shield, a Crunch still does a decent chunk, but I take him out too. The Gigalith comes out with some sand, but falls to an Iron Head. I should probably have just given Aegislash a Cherry Berry here and killed everybody with him, but I wanted to share the load. Two down, two, and a third to go. It's finally time to see who the better Alolan Ghost Trainer actually is. Acerola taunts me with her still alive Binet, but Ghost Rider is unfazed and kills with a single Shadow Ball. The Sandcastle, also a jab at my dead one, suffers the same fate. For the Anchor, I mix things up with a Flamethrower. This brings out Frostlass, who will certainly outspeed and can deal a decent chunk of damage from her own Shadow Ball. Instead though, she confuses me. That's fun. The White Lady dies in a single hit. Last is her Drift Blim, and I'm getting pretty tired of her taunting me with all her alive Pokemon, big deal. A Shadow Ball barely misses out on the kill on the first turn, and I still have a trick up my sleeve, so I feel like it's safe to stay in. As the Drift Loom heals, and I still don't hit myself. Things are going pretty well, and for the fourth time in a row, I hit through Confusion and recover from it next turn to win a damageless victory. That one had quite a bit of luck involved, to be honest. 
But as you can see, Ghost Rider had a Cassette Berry the whole time, so he could have tanked at least one hit before needing to swap. Against the last Elite Four member, Kali and her birds, I feel like I have a pretty solid strat. As long as I tank the first Brave Bird with Corpse Bride, I can set up with two Flame Charges. I survived the hit, thankfully, and will now outspeed to kill the bird. What? Even with a speed boost and a ton of speed EVs, he went first? That was lame, and probably the most impactful death of the run. Corpse Bride has been a huge help this whole game. I can't believe he's really gone. Okay, time for plan B. Or more accurately, plan A. Just Slash. He comes out, and I am showing no mercy here. It's time for a Swords Dance sweep to avenge our fallen comrade. I tank a Brave Bird and kill with a single Iron Head. Against the Haolucha, I protect with King Shield to heal with leftovers and lower his attack. Next turn, an Iron Head takes him out too. After the initial stall against Mandibuzz, she confuses me, which is not going to work here, so I rein in my Lust for Vengeance and pivot to Slimer on a Brave Bird. To make sure I don't miss, I use my Z-move that just so happens to get a crit. That's the first time I've seen a crit Z-move actually. Nice! The Toucan comes out next, so I decide to swap back into Aegislash on a Screech, which isn't great, but it is what it is. After a Swords Dance, and losing almost half of my HP in a Beak Blast, the Toucan falls to one last Iron Head, as I get burnt. Last is the Oricorio, so I bring out Samra Morgan to give the burnt Aegislash a break. She confuses me with Teeter Dance, that's fine, I have time, and then dies to a single Choice Specs Scald, winning us the Elite Four, but at a very heavy toll. Stupid EV trained Pokemon, that's supposed to be an advantage that I have, not given to trainers like you. With the Elite Four down, there's only one last challenge, and it just so happens to be Hao, who for the first time in this entire game is awfully serious. He means business. His Raichu, leads against my Slimer. This time, I knew he was going to outspeed, I've learned my lesson there, but Raichu falls to a single Shadow Claw anyway. This brings out Tauros, who threatens with Iron Head, so Aegislash comes out and tanks it. I King Shield to protect against the Earthquake, then pivot to Bruce Willis on yet another Earthquake. He immediately gets a crit Iron Head, so that's fun, and my Leaf Blade doesn't even do half to him. He swaps to Flareon as I fully heal with Synthesis. That's fine. Obviously, I bring out Ghost Rider because the Flareon can't do squat to him. And after healing once, a second Shadow Ball takes him out. Tauros makes a return, so we repeat the same story. And Bruce comes out on an Earthquake, tanks a Zen Headbutt, and almost kills with a Leaf Blade. But the Tauros barely survives. We both heal at the same time, and after a few more turns of Leaf Blades and Synthesis, Bruce is the victor and is almost fully healed. Against Crab Abominable, Aegislash comes out and actually takes a decent chunk from Ice Hammer. I should kill him in one hit, so I don't bother with King Shield, and he totally survives because I was supposed to use Iron Head, not Sacred Sword. That was not very smart of me. A second Ice Hammer almost kills me, but I'm not dead yet. That was close. One more Sacred Sword takes him out. The Noivern comes out, and after a King Shield, it's time for Samra Morgan to take a turn. She easily tanks a Dark Pulse, thanks to a Culper Berry, and disables it. She is really good at that. Well, there's only one thing left to do here. Kill with a four times effective Ice Beam. That went surprisingly well. I was prepared to sack her right here if I had to. Last, Primarina. And I meant to teach Samra Protect here, just in case how used his Z-move, but I didn't. Oh well. I decide to stay in to bait the move, and he just uses Moonblast, that Samur survives, and disables. I retaliate with the weakest Psychic known to man, and since the only attacking move he can use is Water type now, I think it's safe to bring out Bruce Willis. I mean, he's not going to waste his Z-move on a Jellyfish with 3 HP now, is he? Or apparently he will. I do survive, but it does a decent chunk of damage. After healing myself with Synthesis, a Leaf Blade one-shots the Primarina and I have officially beaten Pokemon Ultra Moon for the very first time, and with only Ghost Pokemon. If this is the first Nuzlocke of mine that you've watched, please don't judge me too harshly. I do recognize there were plenty of mistakes that I made in this run, but overall, 
considering I've never played Ultra Moon before and the Totem Pokemon are a new experience for me, I think I did reasonably well. I'm glad that I could finally find a generation where ghost Pokemon are very well represented. It just sucks that everyone in Alola seems to have dark moves like Bite and Pursuit. Was not a big fan of that. But hopefully you enjoyed the video. And if you did, watch out for my next run where we're going to Johto.